Welcome to Midwest Hunting Outdoors. In this episode, we're going to be with Jennifer Felton, national award-winning artist. See how she takes a piece of wood like this, from this, to this beautiful piece of art. Desperado, sitting in a old Monte Carlo, a man inside his hollow. Hey, thanks for joining the channel today. We've got, uh, Tim, we've got a special guest, Jennifer Felton, who uh, we're trying to debate if it's art or woodworking or wood carving. So we're just going to call it master artist um, because the work that she does and we'll include some pictures here is just amazing, amazing work. So, uh, but we're going to talk with Jennifer today, how she takes uh, something that she sees out in nature or uh, out of her window here in her art uh, shop and turns it into some of these beautiful pieces of wood. So Jennifer, thank you first of all for allowing us to spend some time with you. Absolutely, thanks for coming to the studio. Absolutely, it's beautiful. And uh, so, you know, maybe let's uh, get into just getting to know you a little bit. If you could introduce yourself and how you got into woodworking and uh, you know, maybe what's your latest, you talked about some challenges coming up here in April. <laughs> right. so. Yeah, well, that's one thing. Maybe the first thing I should mention is I'm always pushing myself to try something new um, and to, to, I'm not really afraid to take a leap. So I guess that's how I kind of got into this too. My husband and I ended up buying 60 acres of timber northeast of us here and um, wanted to build a cabin on it. So we decided to build this cabin and it's primitive completely off the grid and so we built it one summer together and I wanted an owl on the newel post going up to the sleeping quarters and I thought I can do this I can carve an owl having never carved anything before in my life I got one picture which is ridiculous now compared to how many pictures I have to start with something that I do now one picture borrowed dad's Fordham and just dove in reasonably satisfied with the outcome went to the paint store got some stain of all things and stained it and it now lives on the newel post over at the cabin. And I thought, well, this was pretty fun. I liked the challenge of this because it was 3D visual challenge, plus new tools, plus wood, and all these different things that I could kind of bring into play together. I went to a four-year art school, but to study graphic design. So in Minneapolis, we had four, uh, six weeks of woodworking and six weeks of welding. So that's kind of how you start as a freshman, which is pretty cool. I love that part of it. But there was really nothing that ever got me back to those courses later on because I went on the graphic design track. So I knew that this was something I wanted to get back to and loved it. So I decided to do a Great Horned Owl next, which is ridiculous. That's a, that's a huge project. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I did it. Uh, and I created that what's called a smoothie, meaning there's no... Each feather does not have a contour. It's just a kind of a shape of an outline of an owl. And then you paint it to trick the eye into believing that it has dimension, right? Huh. So I painted it and thought, again, I don't, this was fun, but it can't just live on my mantle. That's boring. So I got online, found the Word World Carving Competition, bought myself a ticket to Ocean City, Maryland, flew out there myself, entered it, and I won. <laughs> Wow. So it was the, with, with the owl. With the owl, yes, nice. yes, the great horned owl, um, and it was the you know novice, lowest end of the whole competition. Had no idea that this world even existed. Had never met a carver before in my life, and I saw everything. I saw the masters and all the tools and all the different things you could have. And these people were just so willing to share everything that they were doing, all their tips and techniques and things. And I thought, well, this is I got to do this. So I bought everything I could think of that would help me. All the tools. I thought, this is what I'm doing. Came home, we carved out a little corner in the basement in one of the last room we had left in the basement and that became my little carving studio. It was like eight foot by six foot and then, and then we cleared out more of the room and it came you know, eight foot by, by 10 foot. And so I had that little space for 14 years that I worked with and just kept entering. And I knew I wanted to be a master and this past spring I got there. Awesome. Wow, congratulations. So that was my journey, yeah. So just self taught and, and, and kept pushing say, myself. As they say, the rest is history, right? <laughs> yeah, I, guess, so, I guess. Awesome. Yeah. Well, again, folks will include pictures here, but we're living it here as we're looking around the room at some of the art, and it's just amazing. Thank you. Yeah, so maybe a good place to start after, after this is can you kind of walk us through, you know, your, your process of going from a, really an idea, probably, yeah. an idea to one of these masterpieces that you've got in your shop. Yeah, show. I can. There's, um, so like I said, I like to challenge myself. So I, to spend 900 to 1100 hours at a minimum on one piece, you really gotta be into it, right? You really have to have a drive for getting to the end. So I always 
look for different ways I can, I can have competitive advantages or things that I'm interested in, like the paint job on the pheasant. That's going to be hard. I got to try it. Or, you know, the piece I'm doing now, there's no way it should balance. It should, it should look like it's tipping over, but it's not going to, you know, those little things that challenge me, keep me invested long-term, right? So I try to pick something that's interesting to me in some way that'll help me persist to the end. So I figure out what that is, and then I start with drawings. Typically, I'll do something that's like a concept drawing. Depending on, if it's just for me, I'll do a quick sketch. If it's for a, a patron, then I'll do something more detailed because they're gonna want that original sketch back. Um, sometimes I've done it just in my head and I've not drawn anything out because I know what I want it to look like so I can get there. Depends on how much time I want to put in up front. And then I'll figure out my patterns. So I've never used anyone else's pattern ever. You can if you want to try to carve things. That's a legit way to go. For the carving competitions though that I enter, it's not allowed. So I've never started that way. So I'll draw my a, a top pattern and a side pattern, put them on a, a you know whatever block of wood it's going to fit on, trace it this way, trace it this way, cut it out on the bandsaw. And then I'll usually go outside and use a four inch grinder to get a little closer. So you still have the hard edges when you cut it out on the bandsaw, right? You've got the, the profiles, but you still got to round the body out of it. Right. And I can do that with the Fordham tool. And if it's a small enough bird that works, if it's something like a great horned owl or an eagle though, you're spending hours with the Fordham tool with a sanding drum and that's just not worth the time. So the four inch grinder with a sanding you know, wheel on it just works the best. Plus it's kind of gritty and kind of like welding and you know, getting it, you just get in there better. I like being all sawdusty and covered with masks and anyway, so that's part, part of the fun. Um, then I come inside, go to the Fordham tool, refine more, and then I get to the point where I'm really figuring out the symmetry, always the center lines always preserved and so I'm measuring down and across and I'm making sure that every step I go through has the symmetry or intentionally doesn't, right? If one wing's down and one wing's up, then I need to plan for that and account for that, which makes it all the much harder. Or both wings out is like doing three birds instead of just one. Right. So it depends on the points that you need to reach. But if it's just a bird that's perched, it's a little easier to get the symmetry matched. And I just keep working my way through it. So I'll round the body, typically work on the tail, start to define those individual feathers and the undertail coverts, and then I'll work up the, the bird. I usually don't set the eyes and, and commit to the face right away. Other carvers do it reverse. They want the face first and then they'll work down because if you screw up the face, you're basically losing the rest of the piece. Um, so you can cut the head off and put a new block on. It's just you compound the work then because then you've got lines you need to hide and, and work around through the rest of the process. So once you get the piece carved, then I'm doing all of the individual feather contours. So each feather, it's like landscaping. Each feather has its own bump series to it. And then everything needs to be as thin as possible. And the Tupelo is perfect for that because while it's really pretty soft and you know, lightweight, I can, I can put my fingernail into it and, and you know, dent it, but it's strong. Yeah. So that's what's really nice about it. It also holds a nice sharp edge compared to like a basswood, which will fuzz on you when you go to um, sand it. This doesn't fuzz at all. So it's nice to know that you can preserve that edge. Is that the two types of wood that most carvers use is the Tupelo that I've heard basswood? of That I've heard of, yes. And I don't hear of many people using basswood much in what I do in the realism. They might in, in other aspects of carving. Obviously people will do, you know, ash and walnut and things if they want to preserve the wood grain and they aren't going to paint something out all the yeah. way. Um, and they just want to, want to show that like, like my entry door, you know, it's just the relief carving and I wanted you to see that grain. Um, so I get to that point where all the landscaping, if you will, is all in place. And then I'll take the wood burner and I'll do um, each quill. I usually press in the quills depending on where it is or I'll wood burn them in. And then every barb of every feather. So there's thousands of <laughs> wood burned lines all over it. I'm usually wearing um, a micro visor to do that. I'm about this far away from my piece. Um, and just really concentrate to get those as close as I can. And then weirdly, the whole thing gets covered in white. Paint, white yeah, yeah, because it's so the wood burning is so beautiful that I've, I've been tempted at times to leave it wood burned because it's really pretty. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, but then I don't get to paint it and then it's not going to, you know, really come to life like I want it to. But I thought, well, yeah, I, I got to see it all the way through. But one of these days I'm going to stop a piece at wood burned. We'll see if I get there. I don't know. But so I'm assuming the white kind of gives you a clean canvas. Exactly. If you will, so the, exactly. the color mix 
pops better. Mm -hmm. and... Yeah. And some people will use what's called a, a gesso, which is a paint that is like a primer, if you, if you will, if you're going to relate it to something else in the paint world, but it has little pieces of marble in it. And so it's going to, it's going to take the tan away from here, right? So if I've got tan, or let's say this is the dark of the wood burn, because it would be about this hue. If I put um, let's say, you know, the green or the red of the, of the pheasant's head on this, this is going to show through. It's like painting a red wall in your house white. Yeah. You're always going to see that color underneath it. So you've got to get it to a neutral tone before your true color that you want will be there. And so, sense. so you've got to get rid of the tan. Otherwise it's going to skew every color you put on top of it. So then everything's painted white, but I could only paint it in white in stages because I don't want to fill in my burn lines. And they're so fine that I could easily put too thick of a coat on and then there went all that texture work. So I do that in a lot of stages until I get it to the point I want. And sometimes if I know something's going to be brighter, like the wattle of the pheasant, it's going to be a bright red. And I even had, I even used hunter orange on that for some accent when I was painting it. Um, I made that a lot whiter than the rest because I knew I wanted that intense color in that spot. So just an example, like it's kind of malt, um, modeled in terms of where I put the white. And then I start the painting. The painting is a whole other thing. Um, I'll typically start by blocking in the patterns and I start the tail. I always start the tail and work my way up, but I'll block in the patterns and then I'll go back and add layers and layers and layers of paint to intensify everything. So I bet I go around the bird eight to 10 times with, you know, the different layers of paint. And then if it gets iridescent or something like that toward the end, the extreme highlights and the extreme low lights I'll be adding toward the end. But it's tricky because at the beginning, when you're blocking in that pattern, you're adding a lot of paint. But a lot of paint is like the size of my thumbnail for the day. Like that's a lot of paint for oil paint because I'm an oil painter, not an acrylic, which makes me different than, than the other people that carve with me. I like the control of it. I like the slow dry of it. I like that I can model it. And I'm a brush painter, hate the airbrush. Hate, I hate the airbrush. You did hear me say that. <laughs> oh, I, I just, I, I think it a hates, I, I, think it, I think it hates me too. Um, I've never gotten used to it. And my worst fear is getting a beautiful gradient and then having it go plop and splat all over my beautiful gradient. So I refuse to work with it. <laughs> I'm stubborn. Um, so I'm a brush painter, but you start with applying a lot of paint and the more you work, you're just dabbing and dabbing. So you've got to really kind of use some self-control to put less and less paint on. But I use paper plates like those there at the, about the size of, you know, a small sandwich plate or something. Five, six inches. Those are my palettes. I, I put my oil paint on those and then I use the mixing sticks and I, but I can cover that up and use that paint again the next day a little bit, depending on what color it is and how fast it dries. But the white is the slowest to dry and takes seven to 10 days. Yeah. So you also have to plan for that, which is, it's just, I like that challenge. The study and, and the hours that it took for the, for the life-size eagle that you started with, I took maybe seven or eight trips down to a rehabilitator and, and sat in a room, it was so great. She locked me in the room, it was so awesome. Got locked in the room that was like a horse, it's an old horse stall with a eagle that wasn't tethered, but she's partially blind from lead poisoning, so she's an education bird now that Kay uses to go to the schools. And so I got to be locked in the room with her and she kind of came over and bluffed me a few times and she'd call and she was not unsettled that I was there because she's used to humans. She's, she's an Ed bird, but I was a different human. So she had to kind of figure out how, how bold is she? Can I scare her? I'm the, I'm the king of the bird world, which she's saying to me. And I just, you know, Kay had advised me to just sit quietly and observe and be fine. But it was thrilling. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because those talons and the, the power they have. I've been hit in the face by eagle wings studying them. And it's just, I don't know, it's just great. The, the, <laughs> the magic you feel when you're around a, a bird of prey um, when they're on someone's glove is just really cool. Yeah, it's amazing. Tim, what questions do you have? I'm kind of dominating the question. Well, you know what? <laughs> My answers know. are all so long. No, Sorry. I don't even really know if it's so much a question. It's like, you know... Joel's one that introduced me to you and asked me to go out to your website. Okay. And, uh, you know, as I'm sitting here listening to you, I'm, this is what's going through my mind. It's like, boy, she's a national award winning artist. She's a carver, paint, <laughs> painter, right? Design, uh, the research and study. It's just all the little facets that go into making a piece really come, come alive. 
I mean, and, I mean, it's awe-inspiring. And I really mean that. It's, uh, it's pretty you. impressive. There's a, there's a lot of different pieces to it. And I think if you're curious enough and hungry enough to really do your best, that you're going to keep seeking the answers to the questions you have, right? Nothing's, nothing's ever... This is, this is my flaw. I will tell you my flaw. I have super high expectations of myself. I never meet my own expectations ever. I look at that pheasant, I see everything I did wrong. Yeah. I like it. I'm proud of it. I think it's a good piece. But I can tell you what I wish I'd have done different on everything. Still so beautiful. I think that hunger and that curiosity pushes me to, okay, what's the strategy here? What's the, what's the emotion here? What's the time of year? I'm thinking through all of those small details because it lights my fire, right? It keeps me going, keeps me hungry for more, but it also helps me persist to the end. And then every piece I do, I feel like I get better. But Jennifer, which is kind of cool. What you just described, not the average individual. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> Maybe I take that for granted, huh? Yeah, you, you are a top <laughs> quarter percenter. Well, thank you for that. I mean, yeah, it's impressive. It's, I, I sometimes I have to I have to admit, I feel like everybody has the same vision I do. I can, I can look across the farm field and think, okay, if I would put a house there and a, and a pond there and the, the, the wind block would be there and the driveway would go this way and here's how it would lay out and maybe I would change it that way because of these reasons and I can picture it done. And I think I, that's one of my, I feel like everybody can do that. And Todd, my husband's constantly saying, yeah, no, people can't, can't do that. I can close my eyes and tell you what this room would look like with wallpaper on the walls. I just, it just, it's part of what I do. That's awesome. So I just assume everybody has that skill. I'm on Todd's side here. Yeah, yeah. Take that as a compliment. Yeah. But, uh, well, your passion certainly comes took, out. It took and, me a and, while to figure that out. And through. So, yeah. so I, got a, I got a couple questions, mm -hmm. Jake. So um, first one is, so where do you get your inspiration on, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a pheasant or I'm going to do great horned owl. Where, what is it that says, this is my next project? There's a logical answer to part of it, COVID, <laughs> weirdly. And then um, the other is it just has to interest me. So I'll do the first one. So I was primarily a raptor carver up until COVID hit. So I you know, did the, did the owls, did the falcons, did the hawks, did the eagles, because that was the category I entered in the world show as I worked my way up. When you work your way up from novice to intermediate to advanced and then get into masters, you have to win multiple years in a row to get moved up to the next category, you can't, your division. You can't just go on your own. So I, I want it, because of the intense study and focus, it's fun to be around those birds and I know I can find them. It's hard to find a songbird. You know, I mean, they just kind of fly through and that you can't really see them, but I know I can go study with a rehabilitator for a great sure. horned owl or an eagle or something. There's state parks that have them and things. So that's where I started. But then COVID hit and I did an owl and an eagle because they didn't have the competition, but I didn't quit carving. I thought, oh, this is a chance to get ahead and up my odds, right? Because then I can put two pieces in one category and have a chance at first, two chances at first, maybe competing against myself, which is kind of a bummer, but my odds get up, which is good. Sure. So I had the great horned owl and the eagle and then I thought, uh-oh, COVID hit, you know, still was ongoing. So the next year they didn't have the competition. I thought, okay, now this is a bit ridiculous. I don't want to compete against myself in three different ways. So I diversified and decided to do the pheasant, which was upland game. So a different category, but still in the same division. And then again, they didn't have the competition. So I did a songbird. So it was the first upland game bird and the first songbird that I'd ever done that actually put me over the edge into the masters because I it was, it was so strange. The people that were there at the competition that year had never seen it done before, which I'm pretty proud of, but I was in advanced and I had one double blue, meaning I had one blue ribbon in category. And then they take all the category first together and they judge first for division, which is advanced right below masters. You have to get two blue ribbons twice to get into masters. So I got my first one before COVID happened. So I'm like, oh, COVID's That's handled, nice. managed. And so they're gonna have the competition the first year I'm coming back fierce. So I came back with four pieces and first year Todd went with me, which was cool after so many years of going myself. What I'm brave enough to do, but it's fun to have a buddy, you know, to go with you and share sure. the joy. And so I had an upland game, songbird, and then two in birds of prey. And I got 
first in all of those. So I took first in all three categories. So like out of songbirds, it's like 250, 300 people I competed against. In birds of prey, maybe 25, 30, and in upland game, four or five. So it was really like varied. So I got first and then they took all three of my firsts and the other couple of firsts, the categories I wasn't in and put them together. And then I got first, second, and third for the entire division. Oh, wow. Which nobody there had ever remembered one artist doing in one year. So that was super cool. Wow. So that was the reason I did those that, that year. Now when I pick a piece, um, I just want it to challenge me and, and really um, be something handsome or beautiful in the end. Depends on what I'm going for. But when I do commission pieces for people, I... I'm not thinking, oh, this isn't a commission piece, I'll t or it isn't, isn't an award piece, I'll take it easy. It means just as much to me as, as doing an award piece. So I'll trick it out, or I'll try a new technique, or I'll do something different to figure it out, and that's what keeps me excited, because I'm always learning something. I'm always pushing myself. So if I'm not pushing myself, I'm bored. So I, it created another <laughs> question. <laughs> as I rambled. <laughs> Is there a category you think that's the most competitive? Yeah, I think bird. The most comp the most crowded is songbirds in advanced. Before you get to masters, once you get to masters, it's flat. There aren't the categories anymore, um, or as as easily discernible categories. So I would say that songbirds is the is the toughest in advanced, and I would say birds of prey is the second toughest. So if someone was interested in commissioning you, mm -hmm. what does that process look like? Just get a hold of me through the website or give me a call. Tell me what you're interested in. I typically, you know, ask questions. Do you want a half size, a third size, a life size? Because I can do different sizes of things too. It doesn't have to be full size. Sometimes people have a shelf they want it to fit under a mantle. You know, some size requirements, which mm -hmm. is fine. So I, I make sure to listen to those. And then I want to know if they have a story that they want captured. Like I was walking through the woods and, and great horned owls aren't, seen much but i saw one i had this moment you know this connection with it or you know something that means something to them sure. and then i try to um figure out how to tell that story in what i'm doing because it makes it more special to the individual sure. um, and i want to try to hit that chord if i can and i'll do a, a drawing a realistic drawing uh and then i take a photograph of that because they usually aren't around my neck of the woods mm -hmm. And I'll send them the photo or the drawing digitally, and then they get to approve it or say, "Oh, Jennifer, you know, could you could you make this change or could you make this change?" And I'll accommodate and make that change, or I'll say, "I'm not sure that's going to look okay, but here's what idea you sparked in my head when you asked for the change. How about this is an alternative?" So we kind of talk it through until we get a composition we like, and then I'll start carving. Uh, depends on what it is. I think the longest it's taken me to do a full bird half size or larger was but four months solid solid through so i'll create the sculpture but all the way through i'm taking pictures of the process too because you get the original drawing the sculpture or the carved piece and then a book in the end so the book because i have the graphic design background that i mentioned before i'll take those pictures and work them into a book a photo photo book and then I make two copies of it. The, the commission or art patron gets one copy and I keep one copy and that's it. I never make more copies of that book. Yeah, that's great. It's kind of fun for them that's, to have the provenance. And that is the, a you, great touch. You can't take the pieces everywhere. And sometimes people can't always come to your home, but you could take the book and show someone if a you were interested in doing book. that. Yeah. yeah. All right, so I've got uh, my last question. So I'm, I'm, I'm an aspiring artist. Okay. And I would like to see, I'd like to attain the heights that you've done. What advice would you give someone uh, that's early on in your career to, oh. to, to get to where you're at? Sounds like don't get COVID. <laughs> yeah. That's one <laughs> that's, that's, I learned here. That's number one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or if you do, don't sit on the couch the whole time. For you sure. know, right while the pandemic happens, keep carving. Um, I would say expose yourself to the world, right? Like get as many different books as, as you can get. I haven't taken many classes from people. You can take classes from some of the master carvers and go to like a 10 day seminar with them. Those are pretty interesting because they walk you through the whole process and you can understand how they do it. And it's fun because you're around like like-minded individuals. 
I've done a few of those. Not sure I learned what I expected to learn, but it was fun to be around the individuals. I think I was just a little more advanced than the class I signed up for. I think I didn't pick the right class, mm -hmm. but the, but to be around those artists was, was just, I still can remember the things I learned from the artists, not from the hands-on, but what the artists said and what still pushes me today from what they said. Sure. So that that's kind of nice. The other thing is, I would say go to the competitions. Pick where you want to be. Like the first time I went out to the World Carving Competition, I wanted to be over there at the master's table. I'm going to get there. And I set the goal for myself and I just figured out how to do it. Don't give up. Keep pushing all the way through and seek the answers you need. It's not going to be the same answer for everybody because someone's going to have a, a better skill and set in this area or a better skill set in this area and work on the skill sets that you need to improve and seek the help you need. Don't be afraid to ask people. The carving community is incredibly generous and giving with advice and tips and tricks and the don't do's as well. You know, you didn't know your bird here. This is an epic fail. They'll flat out tell you that. Do this next time. And you're like, oh, I'm never going to forget that. <laughs> I've had a few of those. Jennifer, let's, uh, let's kind of close out the episode with, um, let's get your website out there again. What's yeah, the jenniferfeltonart.com. We'll, you can just search my name too and likely find it. And we'll put that on the episode Great. here so people can get to it really okay. easy. Sure, feel and free then, to email me questions that you have. If you're, if you're a carver and you have some questions, I'd be glad to give you some advice too. And then you've got some more publicity coming up here in yeah. April, it looks like. Yeah, the Popular Woodworking Magazine. I hope that isn't shining incorrectly. I'll do this a little bit so you can <laughs> see. Um, but on the cover, and then there's a 16-page article inside that walks you through how I carved the pheasant that was in Pheasants Forever. So you can see step-by-step step what I did and learn some tips and tricks and techniques. And some of my tools, too, are a little bit unusual. I'll use anything I can find if it does the job. So there's some step-by-step some -step instructions there. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, congratulations on, I can see, I can see why you're award-winning the oh, job. Oh, thank you. Around here, the you're passion too kind. That you have. So thank you. I want to do thank you yes, for the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. You so you're welcome, fellas. Thanks for coming to the studio. You're welcome. Until next time, be safe, have fun, and get outdoors. <laughs>